Okay, so a little less high class looking video, but a lot easier for me because I don't know how to time this part and um, we're just going to wing it. So we want to talk about now what's actually called public choice theory. We've talked about some of the history of this and some of the economic old school of this, but there's a side theory to all of this government stuff, which is called public choice theory. It's probably not the best possible name for it, but it's what we got. So here's James Madison. James Madison eventually becomes president of the United States. He is regarded by most people as the primary author of the Constitution. There's other people who are at the convention who various folks argue had a big piece in it. And we know that Madison and Jefferson, Jefferson was in France at this time as the U.S. ambassador to France, but that Jefferson and Madison were corresponding as well as you could have corresponded back then, which meant you wrote a letter and you put it on a boat. And they didn't have um, text and emails and all that stuff. But anyway, as the Constitution is put out to the public, Madison and Hamilton and a guy named John Jay write these documents called the Federalist Papers are published in newspapers in New York. And Madison writes the parts about structure of the government and why it's a good structure. And in Federalist, and there's 85 of these, and this is in number 51, he said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, Neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. So somehow you have to give the government the power to do its job, and at the same time protect the people from abuse by that government. And that, in Madison's world, is a tough task. So this public choice theory begins actually in 1962. A man named James Buchanan, who's going to win the Nobel Prize for it eventually, uh, his partner Gordon Tulloch at the time, Buchanan and Tulloch, and then it's picked up by people like Gary Becker from the University of Chicago, who's a very also a Nobel Prize winner and very famous for talking about how economics applies to things other than business. Gary Becker's whole career is how do we use economics to analyze crime and politics and life at home and schools and anything that isn't a traditional kind of business thing. So, so, we believe consumers optimize their utility. You're, that your job as a consumer is to make yourself as happy as you can to maximize your utility. That, and when you go take actual econ class, we'll talk about alternatives to that and some of that, and we'll hit a little bit of that later in class. But just accept the basic economic premise that we've talked about, which is your goal in life is to be as happy as you can and you act in your own self-interest. The standard theory of economics says people act in their own self-interest, that they do things because those things are good for them. And again, Adam Smith believed that in a free market economy, people doing what's best for themselves would end up also doing what's best for society at the same time. There was this invisible hand, this interaction, between buyers and sellers and all this stuff. And it wasn't a bad thing that people were out there for themselves. They'd actually end up doing good for everybody. Okay? So if we take that theory and we decide that it's going to apply to lots of other things, okay? And 
actually, you know, people have tried this on things like birds and mice and stuff to see if they, you know, pursue their own self-interest and they play in market. And so we'll come back to that. But anyway, what do voters do? If you said that voters are going to play the politics game, the voters, in their own self-interest, what does that mean they do? If we say that politicians are going to act in their own self-interest, what are they going to do? And if we say that the government bureaucrats, the people who work for the government, are going to act in their own self-interest, what do they do? The purpose of what we're doing right now is the first two of these. We will come back a lot and talk about the third one. We've already talked about the third one a little bit. Economists are going to argue through this public choice theory that voters, politicians, and bureaucrats are what we call rational actors. Doesn't mean you're in a play or a movie or something. All that means is your action should follow this idea of rational behavior. That you're going to choose to do what's best for you, right for you, good for you, and that's how you're going to make your decisions. You're going to make them based on the economist version of rationality, which is what's good for yourself. That suggests that politicians aren't out there because they want to do good for the country or good for mankind or good for whoever. And some people find that hard to accept. And it may be that that's mixed in here with all of this, but Bear with me, let's go through it, and you may start to think that there might be something to this. Okay? So, rational actors. Number one, we already have talked about this now six times, but they act in their own self-interest. The voters are going to vote in a way which is to their own self-interest. Politicians are going to do what they do because it's in their self-interest, and bureaucrats, same thing. Number two, everybody responds to incentives. Everybody responds to incentives. So if we gave people $1,000 to vote, more people would vote. If the Republicans gave people $1,000 to vote Republican, more people would vote Republican. People respond to incentives. If a politician says, I'm going to do this, and you're going to end up with more money in your pocket, you should respond to that as an incentive if you believe that person and, and other things there. But... Everybody responds to incentives. And then everybody's going to try to maximize something. We try to optimize. It's um, the stupid Transformer movies, right? Maximize. Trying to maximize something. Try to optimize something. And the question is, what is that something? So question number one. So we're sliding in here before we really get to the details of this is does your vote matter and we're just going to look at this from the last election on a national scale 133 million people voted which means if i didn't vote and i voted but if i hadn't voted that would have been meaningless if 10 more people vote if i can get all my you know facebook friends to go vote that's meaningless so 133 million votes cast. What one voter does doesn't change the outcome. Now, if everybody says that and decides not to vote, then obviously that changes the outcome. But each individual person doesn't really affect the election any. We had 65 million votes cast for Clinton and 62 million for Trump. And you compare that to the fact that Obama, who's the record holder for most votes ever got, got 69 million in 2008, his first term. He got 69 million votes. We can also, though, look at this while we're saying, hey, things don't matter, and recognize that Trump won Wisconsin by 23,000 votes out of 3 million, won Pennsylvania by 44,000 votes out of 6 million, and won Michigan by 11,000 votes out of 4.5 million. Those three states, 
He won by 77,000 votes out of 13 and a half million votes. If those three states had gone the other way, if 77,003 people had voted the other way, on those three states combined, Hillary Clinton would have been president of the United States. So in one sense, we have these huge numbers of voters and it doesn't matter. But in the other sense, because of the Electoral College sometimes, 77,000 people out of 133 million decided the outcome of the election. And then we also know that Hillary Clinton won California by 4.3 million votes out of 13 million, but she only won the national vote by 3 million. So if you take California out, she lost the rest of the country by 1.3 million votes. But because of California, she wins the popular vote. And I'm not saying this to pick any side or either side or whatever side. I'm just trying to tell you that there's all sorts of different arguments you can make. You can make cases of this matters or that doesn't matter. But in general, in general, your individual vote doesn't matter in and of itself. So Buchanan says, what should we do if that's true? And the answer isn't that we should go off and try to be Albert Einstein and figure out every little detail of how the universe operates. The answer is we should practice something called rational ignorance. In other words, if my vote really doesn't matter and how I vote really isn't going to change anything, why should I spend a great deal of time and effort figuring out who to vote for? Okay, costs and benefits. If the benefit is incredibly tiny for my voting, my incentive is to keep my costs low in figuring out what I have to do to vote. Okay. So economists figure that people vote because they have a sense of duty or responsibility or there's peer pressure. My sentiment is you can't complain if you didn't vote. And so I always go out and vote because I want to be able to complain and I can feel comfortable complaining because I voted for somebody. But for most people, there is no observable impact on their lives if they vote or don't vote. It doesn't change anything. Okay, so we're going to display rational ignorance. We're going to spend as little as we can trying to figure out who to vote for. We're just not going to put a lot of cost into it because we don't have any benefit. Fewer than 40% of Americans can name their U.S. senators. Fewer than a third can name the Secretary of State or even their own state representatives. People are remarkably ignorant. You would think because your local representatives have a much greater impact on you that you would be more likely to know who they are. But the fact seems to be that Americans know less about their local officials than they do about national officials, and they don't know any of them either. So the evidence seems to back up this idea of rational ignorance. And the, the question is how rational and how ignorant are we in what effect does that have on a medical?